It is now my pleasure to introduce President Evanson, who will be speaking tonight. We know President Evanson as our stake president, who leads and guides this stake with inspiration and humility and love. But I get to share a little bit with you about his professional career. He graduated from Columbia Law School and clerked for a federal appellate a judge in Washington, D.C., and he spent the last 15 years at the law firm Gibson Dunn, where he practices appellate and constitutional law, including in cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. He has also taught courses on constitutional law at USC and UCI law schools, and this fall we'll begin teaching at BYU Law School. President Evanson. Thank you, Laura. Um, normally, when I give talks on the law, we have to offer people continuing legal education credit in order to get them to come. So it's uh, inspiring to see so many people who are not getting CLE credit. Uh, it's a testament to your love of the Constitution and our, and our great country. I'm grateful to be here on Independence Day Eve to uh, talk about a, a subject that is very close to my heart. Uh, 246 years ago tomorrow, our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence, which announced to Great Britain, uh, to the world, and to history that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That revolutionary document sparked the Revolutionary War, a constitutional convention, and ultimately our written constitution. There have been hundreds of revolutions in world history, and many of them have resulted in constitutions. But there is only one example in all of human history of this succeeding, of a founding constitutional document standing the test of time and holding together a nation. And that's, of course, ours. Our Constitution has survived the growth of 13 small colonies of 2.5 million people into a massive country comprising 50 states, 14 territories, and over 300 million citizens. It survived a civil war, and it has survived multiple culture wars. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believe that this was not only because our founding fathers were brilliant or that we've been lucky. We believe that the creation of the Constitution was directed in part by a loving Heavenly Father. And that is what my message tonight is about. I serve on what's called the Religious Freedom Committee, of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. We are a group of religious freedom scholars, church lawyers, and other practitioners. And as a committee, we put together this presentation to help members and friends of the church understand how or in what ways we believe the Constitution is inspired. Most of you are probably aware that the Supreme Court the last few weeks has issued some pretty consequential decisions in the areas of religious liberty, gun rights, and abortion. My message tonight is not focused on those issues specifically. Instead, my hope is that we can all learn something about the structure of the Constitution and the underlying principles that govern its operation. And those principles are, uh, in my view anyway, far more important than how the Supreme Court decides, decides a particular case on a controversial issue. And it is those principles that where I think we see heavenly inspiration. The most important source for uh, tonight's presentation is a talk that President Dallin H. Oaks gave last year on Easter Sunday in General Conference. Uh, President Oaks is a senior leader of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, it is pretty extraordinary that he devoted a Easter morning General Conference talk directed to an international audience to speak about United States constitutional law. Uh, he emphasized the importance of his message and that he was giving, giving it during what he described as troubled times. So I think that just highlights the importance of this message for all of us and the way senior leaders of the church feel uh, how seriously we should be taking it. Here's a, a brief overview of what I hope to cover tonight. Um, we'll first talk about the inspired principles that are embodied in the Constitution. We'll th then discuss some of the threats to these principles, and then we'll close with our responsibility to uphold and defend the Constitution. First, what is a Constitution? 
As President Oaks put it, a constitution is the foundation of government that provides the structure for the exercise of government powers. Ours is the oldest written constitution in the world, still in force. It is a model for most other constitutions around the world. And the preamble to the document describes some of its aims. They are to form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty. And those are lofty goals, and the Constitution does not purport to accomplish any of them directly. Instead, it is a document that provides the structure for the government to operate in a way that the founders hoped would accomplish these essential goals. And we have a unique perspective as Latter-day Saints in that we don't view the Constitution as only the product of innovative men in the 18th century. We believe that the Constitution was in some sense inspired, meaning directed in some ways by a loving Heavenly Father. In modern scripture, the Lord has stated that he suffered the Constitution to be established. And the feature of, uh, that President Oaks pointed to as, as um, indicative of the Lord's hand was the way that the Constitution secures moral agency. That means maximum freedom for men and women to act according to their individual choices so that they are accountable, so that they can be held accountable at the day of judgment. We see this doctrine articulated expressly in the Declaration of Independence, where the founders declared that men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, such as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, the Founding Fathers believed that government is in instituted by men to secure rights that are given to us by Heavenly Father. And they drafted, negotiated, and ultimately ratified a constitution to do just that. But our belief that the constitution is inspired should not be confused with the claim that the constitution is perfect. It certainly was not perfect when it was ratified, and it still is not perfect today. In other words, our Constitution is not itself uh, a revelation. As President Oaks put it, our belief that the Constitution was divinely inspired does not mean that divine revelation dictated every word and phrase. There are many provisions in the Constitution that are not grounded in eternal doctrine and have no bearing on our ability to exercise moral agency, such as the minimum age of elected officials or um, the number of representatives from each state. And the Constitution, especially as originally ratified, um, contains some provisions that clearly are not inspired and which have had to be corrected over time. For instance, the original Constitution counted slaves as three-fifths of a person for purposes of determining congressional representation. This was included as a compromise to gain the support of slaveholding states. Uh, clearly, this was not inspired. It was evil. It took a civil war and reconstruction amendments to abolish slavery, guarantee equal protection under the law, and provide the right of all races to vote. It took 100, almost 150 years before the Constitution was amended to allow women the right to vote. So we cannot say that every word of the original Constitution was directed by God. It wasn't. And even the inspired principles in the Constitution are implemented by mortal men and women who do not always achieve their intended effects, even those provisions that are inspired. So the question becomes, um, in what ways is the Constitution inspired? If we are to commit ourselves to upholding and defending this great document, um, we should understand what it is about the Constitution that we are defending, what it is we believe is inspired. And President Oaks gave us five principles embodied in the Constitution that he believes are inspired that I want to talk about in some detail. The Constitution declares that the source of government power is the people. It divides power bet between national and state governments. The Constitution enshrines a separation of powers among the branches of the federal government. The amendments to the Constitution include special protections um, for vital individual rights, and the Constitution establishes the rule of law. I'll go through each of these. The first inspired principle is that the government, uh, the source of government power is the people. And popular sovereignty is a major theme uh, throughout the Declaration of Independence and, and the Constitution. 
The Declaration of Independence states that the people create governments to protect their liberty. Governments do not grant liberty, they protect it. And this may seem obvious to us today, but in 1787 it was a novel concept. At the time, sovereign power was generally assumed to come from the divine right of kings or from military power. And although there were political philosophers who had advocated for this concept of uh, popular sovereignty and the power coming from the people, the United States Constitution was the first to actually embody this concept, the first to actually put it in print and form a government around that central theme. But a theme you will see throughout the constitutional debates is that the Constitution did not create a pure democracy. As President Oaks put it, we exercise power through elected representatives. Pure democracy uh, was associated with mob rule, meaning groups of people using force and intimidation to compel government action. And as James Madison explained in the Federalist Papers, that pure, pure democracies had historically led to turbulence and contempt, contention, and they had been short-lived. So the founders wanted a more stable form of government, a constitutional democratic republic where the people exercise their power, again, through elected representatives. The second inspired principle is that the Constitution divides power between the national and state governments, what we refer to as federalism. Uh, federalism is the way a group of uh, colonies with very different cultures were able to form a government that allowed political and moral diversity among the states, while at the same time unifying the country on a limited number of issues where a strong federal government was necessary. And the central tenet of federalism is that the federal government's powers are limited, and those powers not granted to the federal government remain with the states. James Madison, again in the Federalist Papers, explained that the federal government's powers are to be few and defined, whereas state powers are numerous and indefinite. Federalism means that state governments have general powers to police and govern citizens, but the federal government has only those limited powers that are defined by the Constitution. And the scope of federal authority uh, was originally conceived as a narrow grant. Uh, This has been an ongoing constitutional debate from 1787 until last week. (laughs) Um, And it has ebbed and flowed over time, but overall federal regulation has grown way beyond what the founders conceived and has preempted some areas uh, where traditionally states had regulated. If you've seen the musical uh, Hamilton, then you remember the first cabinet debate where the issue on the table was Secretary Hamilton's plans to assume state debt and establish a national defense, or national bank. Um, It's it's, it's, uh, playing in your head right now, isn't it, the the song? Um, I would sing it, but everyone would leave. Um, Well, that is not fiction. Um, That was a very real debate. At the time, it was not at all clear that the federal government could form a national bank, because that is nowhere uh, specified in Article Article 1 of the Constitution. And after Congress created the bank, it was challenged in court and went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in a case called McCulloch versus Maryland, the Supreme Court upheld the creation of the National Bank because although the bank is not specifically identified in Article I of the Constitution, it is necessary and proper to other defined grants of authority to the federal government. So the bank was allowed. And ever since McCulloch versus Maryland, we've seen a steady creep in the federal government's exercise of authority over the states and an ongoing debate of what the proper proper balance is. The third inspired principle embodied in the Constitution is the division of authority among the branches of the federal government, what we call the separation of powers. The principle of separating authority between a legislature and the executive branch was conceived by the Enlightenment philosophers Locke and Montesquieu, and was pioneered by the English Parliament. But again, our Constitution took this a step further and for the first time in human history, created independent executive, legislative, and judicial branches. Uh, The legislative branch writes the laws and presents them to the president. He signs them into the law and then has the uh, authority and obligation under Article 2 to enforce those laws. 
And when there are legal challenges that uh, implicate the interpretation or constitutionality of the laws, uh, the judicial branch has the ultimate say. So in this way, each branch uh, acts as a check on the other branches of government in their exercise of government power and authority. So the president cannot enforce a law without Congress passing it. Congress can pass the law, but it can't enforce it. And the president's and Congress's actions are always subject to being reined in by the judiciary when they exceed statutory or constitutional law. And in this way, this tension among the branches was designed to protect government overreach and to secure liberty for, uh, for citizens. Um, The fourth inspired principle is the special protections of individual liberty that the Constitution provides in the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights was not ratified with the Constitution, uh, but was separately adopted uh, three years after the fact. This was again pioneered in England, beginning with the Magna Carta, and our Federal Bill of Rights was modeled on uh, those that had been adopted in some of the colonies in connection with their state constitutions. President Oaks characterized the Bill of Rights as a cluster of vital guarantees of individual rights and specific limits on government. Uh, The Bill of Rights, as ratified, did not apply to state governments. These were purely protections against federal government overreach. It wasn't until after the Reconstruction Amendments following the Civil War um, and the ratification of the 14th Amendment in particular that the protections of the Bill of Rights were incorporated against the states Uh, to protect uh, citizens from government overreach by state governments. Before the the Reconstruction, after the Civil War, only the federal government uh, was reined in by the Bill of Rights. President Oaks said that without a Bill of Rights, America could not have served as the host nation for the restoration of the gospel, which began just three decades later. Think about just how close in time those events are, the ratification of the Bill of Rights and the restoration of the gospel. Uh, These first five amendments contain some of the most important protections against incursions on individual liberty. It's hard to overemphasize the importance of the First Amendment. It prevents the government from infringing an individual's free exercise of religion. It prevents the government from establishing a religion and thereby disfavoring other religions. And it protects the rights of individuals to speak, assemble, and petition the government for redress. And we see divine inspiration in the First Amendment, both its religious protections and its speech clauses. And we see divine protection in, or inspiration in the other amendments as well, such as protections uh, for criminal defendants and due process in the Fourth and Fifth Amendments. And we could spend hours on each one of these amendments, but I will just mention them. Um, The Sixth and Seventh Amendments guarantee criminal and civil jury trials. the Eighth Amendment prevents the government from, uh, from exercising cruel and unusual punishment. And these provisions continue to be interpreted to this day. Uh, they are a constant source of, of uh, controversy and interpretation and development as uh, new circumstances are presented in cases that make their way up to the Supreme Court. And the Ninth and Tenth Amendments ensure that the Bill of Rights is not somehow construed as being the complete list of all individual rights. And they reemphasize that states retain all the authority that are not, that's not given to the federal government. As I mentioned, the, the, the Constitution was not perfect as originally conceived, uh, far from it. And the Bill of Rights did very little to protect the individual liberty of women and minorities. Some of the later amendments following the Civil War were necessary to secure the promises of the Constitution for all, black and white, male and female. In 1865, during uh, Reconstruction after the Civil War, Congress and the states ratified the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, which outlawed slavery, guaranteed equal protection under the law, and provided people of all races the right to vote. And then, not until 1919, did we ratify the 19th Amendment, which guaranteed women the right to vote. The final principle, um, inspired principle embodied in the Constitution, is its establishment of the rule of law. The rule of law is that all persons are equal before the law. We are governed by a written Constitution and validly enacted statutory law, 
and not by any particular office holder. As John Locke put it, uh, we have one rule for rich and poor, for the favorite at court, and the countryman at plow. And the rule of law is vital to the protection of liberty because when applied correctly, it restricts the arbitrary exercise of power. Um, there are many constitutions uh, throughout the world in uh, countries that have very unstable governments. They have everything written down, but without the rule of law to actually constrain uh, government actors, it means very little. And so the rule of law is vital to the operation and the actual protection, uh, the actual ability of a written constitution uh, to protect individual liberty. So those are the five uh, principles, inspired principles embodied in the Constitution. Um, hopefully that has been informative, um, but it doesn't mean very much without a call to action, without some um, analysis of how it affects our lives and what we need to do to ensure that these principles are protected, that they continue to secure the blessings of liberty as the founders intended. And Pre President Oaks provided some wonderful counsel um, on this. He identified three, uh, or he identified a few principal threats that he saw to the principles that are inspired in the Constitution. First, he pointed to the federal government's incursion on areas of traditional state authority. Federalism is a fundamental protection of liberty, and when the federal government regulates areas that have traditionally been left to state and local, local governments, uh, the Constitution's protections begin to wane. Liberty tends to increase the more local the government regulation, and the more uh, federal government regulation tends to decrease individual liberty. Second, he pointed to pressure on the separation of powers among the federal government branches. Again, the separation of powers is designed to increase liberty by protecting against government overreach. And any time one of the br branches of government arrogates to itself some authority that has been traditionally been exercised by one of the other branches, it weakens the Constitution's ability to protect, against, to protect, protect our liberty. And third, he referenced the dilution of First Amendment rights, like religion and speech. And we've heard several of the apostles speak recently on this topic, as recently as this last general conference. Um, the last few years, the Supreme Court of the United States has issued a string of decisions that have been very protective of religious liberty. This is the most uh, pro-religion Supreme Court we've seen in decades. But the Supreme Court can only take a few religious liberty cases every year, and there are many other jurisdictions, courts, and government agencies where the First Amendment is um, not received the same way it is by a majority of the Supreme Court. So this continues to be a threat. Finally, President Oaks warned against using the Constitution like a loyalty test or a political slogan. And by that, I think he means weaponizing the Constitution in furtherance of political ends rather than respecting the Constitution as the foundation of government in the first place. He said that the stature of the Constitution is diminished by efforts to substitute current societal trends as the reason for its founding instead of liberty and self-government. Um, this is in part why we are stepping back tonight away from the controversial issues of the day and discussing the underlying principles that govern our constitutional democracy. The Constitution is inspired because it promotes liberty and self-government, not because it happens to help us get a particular policy outcome at a particular point in time. In the face of these threats and because of our belief that the Constitution is, is inspired, you and I have a unique and important role to play in defending it. President Oaks encouraged us to uphold and defend the United States Constitution and principles of constitutionalism. And he gave us five ways, um, well, six, five on this slide, um, five ways in which we are counseled to do so. First, we should trust in the Lord and be positive about America's future. We must exercise faith, not despair, over the future of this great country. Second, we must pray for the Lord to guide and bless all nations and their leaders. And this applies when we voted for the official or the party in power and when we didn't. Third, we should learn and advocate 
the inspired principles of the Constitution. Fourth, we should seek out and support wise and good persons who will support those principles in their public actions. And fifth, we should be knowledgeable citizens who are active in making our influence felt in civic affairs. And finally, President Oaks was adamant that as we apply these principles, we recognize that no political party has a monopoly on righteous principles. Principles over parties, he said. And this should affect how we vote and how we treat those who vote differently than we do. And rather than paraphrase him, I thought I'd let you hear this last point directly from here, from him. There are many political issues and no party, platform, or individual candidate can satisfy all personal preferences. Each citizen must therefore decide which issues are most important to him or her at any particular time. Then members should seek inspiration on how to exercise their influence according to their individual priorities. This process will not be easy. It may require changing party support or candidate choices, even from election to election. Such independent actions will sometimes require voters to support candidates or political parties or platforms whose other positions they cannot approve. That is one reason we encourage our members to refrain from judging one another in political matters. We should never assert that a faithful Latter-day Saint cannot belong to a particular party or vote for a particular candidate. We teach correct principles and leave our members to choose how to prioritize and apply those principles on the issues presented from time to time. I'll conclude with this um, quotation from President David O. McKay, who was president of the church in the 1950s and 1960s. This captures my feelings about the Constitution pretty well. Um, Next to being one in worshiping God, there is nothing in the world upon which this church should be more united than in upholding and defending the Constitution of the United States. And brothers and sisters, we live in a tumultuous time. I'm sure it also felt this way during the Great Depression and during the 1960s. Um, I was not around during those eras. So um, this feels pretty tumultuous to me, certainly the worst it's been in my lifetime. Um, But I have faith that all will be well. I know it will be. And that faith is founded primarily on the power and majesty of a loving Heavenly Father to whom my family and I are bound through sacred priesthood covenants. But second to that is my faith in the Constitution. The principles we've discussed tonight are the answers to all the controversial issues of the day. The Constitution has weathered conflicts before, much more intense and, uh, and uh, tumultuous conflicts than today, and it will weather them again. Our job is not to fear, but to dutifully work to uphold these principles. And I'm confident that this is what our Heavenly Father would have us do. We can have good faith, wonderful policy debates on, on, on the moral questions of the day. We can have diverse views on uh, political parties and candidates and everything else. But we should be united on these principles of constitutionalism. One of my favorite aphorisms is attributed to um, St. Augustine or John Wesley, depending on the source. And it's that in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. And these constitutional principles we've discussed tonight um, are essentials. And I hope we can unify ourselves around them and then lovingly invite others around us to join us. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.